And welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe at the busy intersection of faith and reason. I'm Doug Keck and reminding you this is the place to be as we come out of Easter into our Easter week here. And we want you to email your questions to us here at Father Spitzer's Universe at EWTN.com, of course. Check out all of Father Spitzer's websites. There's the Magic Center one and the Credible Catholic one and the one that's always tough to say, PurposefulUniverse.com. And of course, Father Spitzer's Universe is always available on EWTN's On Demand page with all the other great programs we have available. And of course, we recently added the EWTN original documentary, Jordan's Christians, People of the Holy Land, perfect timing for that, to our On Demand page. You should check it out. There are just so many programs there. And our topic today, Two Common Defenses Against Evil from Father's very popular book, Christ vs. Satan in Our Daily Lives, available through our EWTN religious catalog naturally. And I just wanted to mention the book of the month for April, Answering the Questions of Jesus. I can't recommend this any more than I could. Father Andrew Apostoli um, was such a dear, dear priest and a great man, and this was a book he did, and it's really interesting. Check it out, Answering the Questions of Jesus. And uh, speaking of wonderful priests, we have our own Father Spitzer with us out on the West Coast. Great to see you, Father. Hey, great to see you, Doug. I use the term lightly, of course. That's right. Uh, someday I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll get smart enough to change my, my nomenclature here, and my usage of no, terms. No. <laughs> but if you'd like to uh, at least uh, kick us off with a prayer, that'd be great. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us, especially in this Easter season, the blessing of your resurrection and of course, your willingness, your desire to bring that to us. We ask, Lord, that we might proceed toward that resurrection, hope in it, know of it, so that uh, it might uh, govern our lives and that we might enter into the fullness of your love, your morality, your goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray, pray for, for us. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And uh, before we get to our, our topic uh, about how the devil's working overtime and some questions, here's a couple of uh, articles that may be of interest. This one I thought was interesting. It was a talk given by Archbishop uh, Chaput uh, uh -huh. uh, within the last couple of weeks in, in, entitled mm -hmm. Things Worth Dying For, okay? And mm -hmm. he, he makes the comment here, this is midway through the speech, people are angry. They're angry because they feel powerless. And they feel powerless because, in many ways, they are. Americans, culture, and political elites talk about equality, opportunity, and justice, but they behave like a privileged class with an authority based on their connections and skills. Then he goes on to make the point that as Catholics, effectively, we were meant to be leaven. Okay? Instead, quite a few American Catholics have worked our way into the same leadership class that the rest of the country both envies and resents. Okay, and the price of our entry has been the transfer of our real loyalties and convictions from the church of our baptism to the quote-unquote new church of our ambitions and appetites. And then he goes on to allude to people like Nancy Pelosi, Joe Biden are not anomalies. They're part of a very large crowd and problem. And then he goes on to quote uh, Benedict XVI at the time mm -hmm. when he was pope, talking about something he referred to as a silent apostasy. And he quotes Benedict saying, For Benedict, lay people and priests don't need to publicly renounce their baptism to be apostates. They simply need to be silent when their Catholic faith demands that they speak out. Yeah. Well, it goes back, of course, to um, that wonderful phrase by Edmund Burke, all that's required for evil to prevail is for a few good people to remain silent. So, I mean, uh, I think therein lies the, the problem, and the silent apostasy is... Uh, very clear there are just a lot of people who won't speak out or just simply can't speak out because they're so fearful mm -hmm. um, you know of some kind of a uh, you know clobbering that might be done to them um, you know I consider it an honor to be canceled <laughs> on multiple occasions so uh, you know I'm getting a sort so of so when have you ever that. have you ever been canceled since you, you say it no as I yet? haven't been publicly canceled, canceled. but okay. uh, but uh, I, I know that there have been many who wanted to do it okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so uh, in any case the the main point though is uh, 
is that uh, if we're, uh, you know, not going to speak out in favor of the Lord, if we are uh, going to ignore uh, everything with which we were raised in order to give ourselves uh, to the culture, what C.S. Lewis would call the inner circle, mm -hmm. right? If we're going to give ourselves to the new elite uh, class, the elite class will demand of us a certain kind of morality, mm -hmm. a certain kind of belief system. And the problem with belonging to any elite group, any inner circle, is that generally you're going to be required to sort of conform to their standards, mm -hmm. to their uh, morality, to their belief system, which generally does not include Jesus Christ, uh, oftentimes doesn't include God at all, mm -hmm. and, and certainly doesn't uh, uh, include the Catholic Church. So the, the, the point is, that um, it's uh, it's unfortunate uh, that you know moving into those domains, uh, people have allowed their their true morality to go. Now there are certain people who have moved into very high positions. Uh, several of our Supreme Court justices, for mm -hmm. example, have done so. Several uh, incredibly good uh, business people have done so. Uh, some people who are actually in the acting profession and so forth mm -hmm. have done so. But they have done this. Uh, by still <clears throat> maintaining, um, you know, their convictions, maintaining their belief not only in God but <coughs> and in Jesus, but also not hiding mm -hmm. their church affiliation and definitely speaking out on moral issues when that is required. That's the trick too, uh, to be able to be able to do that and to realize that you're called to do that. And I think one of the great things is kind of like the old silent majority thing of the Nixon era, and you kind of hear that a little bit today with the yeah. this silent apostasy, which is effectively is that we need to realize, that's what I think EW10 provides a lot of people an opportunity to realize, yeah. there's a lot more people out there who believe what you believe. And the reality is mm -hmm. the vast majority of people, it's like you quote some of the surveys and things like that, when people have an opportunity to speak out without feeling as if they're threatened or they're going to be embarrassed or made fun of and they can actually share their mm -hmm. true feelings, uh, you know, people are yeah. much more conservative. We see that with, the, in a sense, the revolt of parents having to do with education, right? Oh yeah, no, I think it's great what's going on. They're going down to the school boards and, and uh, they're actually making their voice felt, I think is wonderful. And, and of course, uh, similarly, uh, you know, uh, I've had these experiences before in my life. I remember once when I threw Planned Parenthood uh, off of the campus, uh, I knew I was going to get it. Mm -hmm. And of course, I wound up being in every newspaper you can imagine, and all kinds of people were uh, you know, trying to get me under their radio station to defend my position. Mm -hmm. uh, you can only do that for so long before it becomes old. But uh, I did write in a bunch of guest editorials. But what was interesting uh, through that was mm -hmm. for the first week, uh, I, you know, it was like I was all alone in the world. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, because I just kept maintaining right. my stance, I did not change my mind. I didn't bend to all the people who were telling me to bend. I just kept my position going. Then all of a sudden I started noticing the change in the op-eds mm -hmm. so that people were actually coming in on my side of the thing and not only the Spokane paper but other papers. And so all of a sudden I began to see that other presidents of universities were starting to do the very same thing and were getting a little courage. So you can actually start your own little, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, resistance to the uh, elite secular, uh, you know, uh, code mm -hmm. and uh, their pressure on people uh, to conform, you can actually start your own little resistance to that. Um, you start with yourself, but just keep staying right. on the path, right. you know, keep maintaining, don't worry, God will take care of you. And ultimately, uh, they might get rid of you on one of those occasions. But you know, before you you get are are uh, put under, I'm telling you, right. you're going to cause a lot of people to be courageous. You're going to change right. things. You're not going to be one of the guilty well, bystanders right. who remain silent. Well, it's interesting uh, you talking about that. Kind of reminds me of what, in a sense, what's going on in Ukraine with Zelensky, in the sense mm -hmm. that. In initially, when it happened, most people thought, well, they're going to collapse very quickly. He's going to get out of the yeah. country. You know, he's an actor. What? And the fact mm -hmm. that he stood 
and, yeah. uh, and, and said, we're not going anywhere, and in a sense rallied yeah. his own people, now gave people an opportunity to say, okay, well, this guy's not going to bail. Because a lot of people are afraid, yeah. I'm going to come to try and support him, and while I'm going to support him, he's going to be bailing. And then I'm going to get yeah. stuck out here by myself. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, that's very true. And I, I think, you know, the minute I saw that they were going to resist and that they already, in some sense, had been prepared for resistance, they mm -hmm. had anticipated this, that there were preparations that were already, you know, being put into place, I knew this was going to be a protracted conflict. Mm -hmm. I just knew that the Russians were not going to just roll over them. And indeed, they haven't. And even though they're, you know, collecting up there on the on the eastern side mm -hmm. of, of Ukraine, uh, definitely they're going to have a real difficult time, um, you know, consolidating uh, their position, even in Mariupol. So right. I think uh, we're going to see that this is a, a very protracted conflict right. that uh, right. these people are going to stand for. And they're now, you know, they're stronger and stronger and stronger. I mean, Ukraine is developing into a very, very, uh, you know, strong sort of cultural um, uh, phenomenon that that really is going to it's got its own values I embedded mm -hmm. in it it's got a real sense of strength and nationalism and common good um, the, basically the Russians are galvanizing a right, real exactly, force right, right, uh, right yeah. on their border against right. them well, and the uh, more they kind of yeah. do the uh, civilian atrocities the greater the you know the the stamina will become well you're going to have this pyrrhic victory here I mean what's going to be I mean yeah. you're going to end up with this land that maybe you control and that's beneficial in Russia's mind for connecting to Crimea or whatever, but the people there in yeah. that territory who might have even at oh, one yeah. time had some Russian sympathies, you'd have to think that'll be all gone. Oh, that's going to be gone. And honestly, I'm not so sure that the, that the Pyrrhic victory is even coming. They've got mm -hmm. a lot of military equipment, but I think this is going to be a protracted um, you know, conflict, and you know, those are wars of attrition. Right. And wars of attrition depend a whole lot on the willpower uh, to continue it. And so, you know, maybe there may be some victories here and there in this city or that city, uh, but uh, again, mm -hmm. uh, the, the war itself is a long term one. Um, I don't see the Russians coming to the peace table no. uh, and with anything that looks like a reasonable. Uh, package. They change their minds on a dime. So, I, I think uh, pretty much we're dealing with uh, with something that's going to be protracted. It's going to be mm -hmm. a war of attrition, and I think uh, right. the Ukrainians have an advantage in that kind of a war. They've got the willpower. They've got the desire. It is, after all, their country right. and their countrymen. Innocent children and and women have been killed. Uh, they are uh, they are very motivated. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, speaking of Catholic education, a document came out recently, it was published at the end of last month, from the Congregation for Catholic Education's new instruction on schools entitled The Identity of a Catholic School for a Culture of Dialogue. And there's like 10 takeaways in this particular article that was put together by the, by the uh, register. And I thought a couple of okay. them they, they were highlighted. One of them was, every act in the school should be in accord with Catholic identity. Because that seems to be one a lot of people are concerned about, is that, yes, it says it's oh, a yeah. Catholic school, but I go there and it's not particularly Catholic. Yeah, no, that's right. And I think uh, we are responsible for being who we say that we are. So, I mean, if you call yourself a Catholic school, you, you really ought to have a Catholic identity, not just in name, not just in quote unquote tradition, but in action, in being, in who you really are. And, and that means, you know, you, you, you really do have to uh, put something uh, into the bylaws uh, for, um, you know, the school um, that uh, you're going to require people to have fidelity to the magisterial teaching of the church and that they're, you're going to provide uh, for uh, things to be done within the school setting uh, that will help uh, to uh, maintain a good Catholic and Christian identity mm -hmm. uh, within the school. And, and so um, I, I think uh, th this should be a bylaw provision. And not only that, I think it should be part of the mission statement. And uh, if people um, you know, want to 
uh, put in an identity statement that people should that teachers should sign and staff should sign uh, in working in that institution. Uh, do that too. I mean, the stronger, the better. And uh, so I, I do think that it's time that we either live up to the name of Catholic or just skip the pretense. Right. Skip it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've given it over, if you don't care about it, you know, don't play the game and recruit a bunch of students to a school that is n at best nominally Catholic. Right. It's, it's not right. Another couple of points they make together is Catholic education is for Catholic families and that parents direct their child's education. And again, that's something we're seeing as a groundswell mm -hmm. Uh, in our own country, right? Yeah, in public it's education not just in, as well, right? That's right. That's right. exactly right. That's just good to say. It's not just in Catholic education. Mm -hmm. I mean, parents want their rights back uh, in public education, and they're finally now. There's a lot of momentum to exert their rights, and what's interesting is it's it's really an accelerating momentum. It's a, it's a growing momentum. It's not just inertial. It's a very much on the ascendancy parents are feeling more and more first of all needful of mm -hmm. being empowered and secondly they are empowered mm -hmm. they are doing things and they're finding that they're having success doing things and that's just going to build on itself you know the the, the days of just sort of poo-pooing parents and just put oh leave it up to us professional mm -hmm. educators we really know how to bring religion and morality to your kids that's like, or in the case of public schools, mm -hmm. we really know how to bring proper values to your kids. Nobody believes it anymore. Mm -hmm. they, they, they're, you know, the lie, uh, ironically, the transgenderism uh, stuff and the other kinds of things that have been really proposed uh, in the school, I, I think it just really, the, the, the lie is so right. profound and obvious, parents can't take it anymore. Right. What was that line? I'm sick and tired, and I'm not going to take it anymore. Right, yeah, so, from uh, Network, right, yes. <laughs> network, yeah. Network, right. That's right. Yeah. Howard Beale, the anchor man. Right. Yeah, that's, that's right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, or the, fa the famous Fonzie jumping the shark, as they say. They uh, yeah. jumped the shark. You know, it just went yeah. a little too far, far and brought that attention. <laughs> right. And the other yeah. thing I thought that was interesting here, they, have, they talk about the obligations of every teacher. And this was interesting, by their life as much as by their instruction, teachers must bear witness to Christ, the unique teacher. So that's where you get into the idea where, it's a, as a Catholic school, has something to say about somebody who might be overtly or proclaiming a alternate lifestyle or whatever that might be. Yeah, well, it's not just proclaiming it, it's mm. living it. Mm. I think this is really important that if you really need to live a lifestyle that's completely contrary to Catholic or Christian teaching, well, why do you want to get a job here? Mm. Why, why don't you just get a job somewhere else where, you know, this is not a value? Uh, but the idea of, you know, lying about this when you apply or the idea of not making people, you know, at least, you know, through some kind of a statement as they come on, saying that they're going to make every attempt uh, to um, and, and successfully lead uh, a life commensurate with uh, uh, the moral principles of the Catholic Church, I think it's a reasonable request mm -hmm. because a Catholic school is a Catholic school. I mean, you don't have to apply for a job at that school. Uh, and if that's and they the usually pay less than school, the public schools do, so if you're looking yeah. to... Yeah. works somewhere that's where sometimes you yeah. wonder not in all cases but you know you wonder with sometimes with these situations if there aren't other agendas that are kind of like well I'm gonna come here and, and do some evangelizing of my own oh yeah no the secular evangelization uh, movement of course you know go into the Catholic school and make a proclamation that's utterly confusing and and so forth and so on and I think there is some of mm. that going on uh, no doubt about it but I think Again, this should be headed off with some bylaw provisions and some identity statements and agreements and, you know, uh, incoming faculty members and uh, that sort of thing. I think it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely within the scope of the law for a Catholic school to provide themselves with those kinds of assurances. And, and so I, I don't think anybody has to worry about uh, having a lawsuit. Now, if you've already hired a person without that stipulation, then it gets much more uh, touchy. 
Um, but those things can be worked mm -hmm. out in the long run uh, by, you know, maybe right. trying to buy a person out of a contract or something. Uh, or something of that nature. But like yeah. you say, if you deal with it up front, that's when you can avoid the, the, these, correct. these problems later. What Here's the expectation is, and that you agree to that expectation. Right, absolutely. Exactly. Before we get to questions, one last article uh, was something put out sure. by Archbishop Alexander Sample uh, from uh -huh. uh, yeah. Bishop Portland. Marquette. I'm sure uh, it was at least at Marquette, right? And, uh, yeah. Portland, right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, he had an article, The Problem with the Real Presence. I thought it was interesting. He, he talks about the idea, think about this. We as Catholics make an astonishing claim. We claim the Eucharist is really, truly God himself. Not an image, not a symbol. If we're right about that, then there are eternal consequences. You can consume perfect love and in turn, in turn be consumed by love. But if we're wrong, well, there are eternal consequences. We're violating the first commandment. We must run, mm -hmm. flee, proclaim to the world the abomination that is this church. You see, the problem of the real presence demands a decision. There's no middle ground. We believe the Eucharist is God's saving love. It is God himself really present in all his majesty and glory, completely worthy of our worship. What's your response to that claim? What's your decision? Use your freedom to abandon your resistance to claim the love he is offering you, to claim in him the Eucharist. And I just thought the idea that we are facing in many of these places is you need to make a decision. Yeah, you absolutely do. I mean, I think so many people are just almost going through the motions. And um, I do think we have to present it uh, much more as that very decision that uh, Archbishop Sample is talking about. Mm -hmm. I think we have to get people to say, hey, you know, you, if you're affirming this, you're affirming the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Now, we're responsible for showing that that is the truth. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, again, you could use Eucharistic miracles mm -hmm. to try and, you know, help people to see it. You can try and use the scriptures, especially John 6 and, and uh, you know, 1 Corinthians and so forth to sh show people uh, th that it's there. You could use the church fathers. So we do have a responsibility to uh, show this to people, to show the evidence of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, and to show, you know, tell people what the gifts are that come through this, and the way so many saints have have really lived their lives according to it, and felt that they were strengthened by it. Mm -hmm. But if you put together a really good catechetical um, a package uh, to give to people that really does provide sufficient evidence. Some of these Eucharistic miracles, uh, you know, they're, they're amazing. I just wrote a chapter on them for my book, and I mean, this, the, the real data, the testing that's been done on these things mm -hmm. is really immense. And I could give people just a little sampler if they if they, uh, you know, just, you know, uh, write in mm -hmm. uh, to the Maja Center, I can just give them the article. Um, but uh, I'll tell you one thing, it's pretty impressive. And, um, mm -hmm. and so I think we do have to catechize, but then the whole point of catechism is, what do you think? Right. You say yes or say no. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just remaining neutral to something like this, it is an extraordinary claim after right. all. And, and if it is really true, then it's the road to salvation. And if it's false, then we're a bunch of bums. Right. But the point, of course, is, well, if it's true, then it is the path right. to salvation. Go there. Make the decision. Live according to it. But whatever you do, just don't go through the motions. Right. That, that's the worst thing of all. Yeah, it's kind of like St. Paul with the, either Jesus rose from the dead or he didn't rise from the dead. And yeah. there's a big difference in our future based yeah. on what you believe about that, right? Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, again, we have to look at the evidence, mm -hmm. but if you've looked at the evidence, I don't think you're going to shy away from that truth at all. Well, I have a all. funny feeling, and there's a letter here that has something to do with, I don't know if you're familiar with the Shroud of Turin, but yeah. uh, <laughs> but uh, let yeah. me ask you this question here, Father. You can, yeah. I mean, you may have to do some more research, but dear Father Spitzer, yeah. why hasn't the church authorized another study on the shroud, especially another carbon dating test? It seems most people, including Catholics, still believe the first carbon dating test disproved its authenticity. They are completely unaware of all the other t tests that make it authenticity hard to refute. Do you think the church doesn't want to reveal such compelling evidence, but instead wants people to come to Jesus' reality through a leap of faith, Valentini? 
Uh, well, here's my twofold response. Number one, I think the church won't approve anything unless it's absolutely certain. And that's a hard thing to say. You know, am I absolutely certain? Well, I'm 99.9% .9 of the way there. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to say I'm absolutely certain because there could be something that I do not know of. Now, the 1988 carbon dating, that is a very problematic dating. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and of course, uh, nobody uh, thinks that that uh, dating is accurate at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not only been uh, disproved by Ray Rogers, you know, through the chemical analysis. Mm -hmm. It's also been disproved by a statistical analysis of the raw data by Tristan Cop uh, uh, Capobianca and, and his colleagues. And, and of course, uh, these are all published in peer-reviewed journals, by the way, uh, all these things. So this thing has been completely debunked. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, nature has not come, uh, you know, around to, to you know, uh, withdrawing its claim, you know, that the shroud has been disproven. I mean, unfortunately, they did not examine the raw data of the carbon dating and see um, the stratification, the variegation uh, in all these uh, samples. And so um, when it was discovered by Tristan Kosbyanka, he had to make so many um, you know, appeals to get that raw data. Mm -hmm. Finally, he had to use, you know, a uh, um, um, uh, one of these um, um, Freedom of Information Act uh, requests and finally yeah, like compelled a FOIA the kind of a museum. Thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And he had to he had to basically uh, uh, you know force the bishop uh, the, uh, the the British Museum to give it over uh, the raw data over to the to a responsible party who could uh, analyze it. And of course, it turned out to be uh, just completely. Uh, you know, bizarre uh, result mm -hmm. that doesn't prove at all a medieval dating, but precisely it goes in the opposite direction. Hmm. So, the, the, but the questioner is right. We could use another carbon dating. I think that the, um, there's two questions that need to be resolved. The first thing is, is um, what caused the image? Now we know one thing, radiation caused the image. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that can cause the image. And there's, a, I, again, I have a whole uh, article on this. Uh, radiation explains all 36 enigmas on the shrouds mm -hmm. uh, image and blood. Now the main thing that uh, has to be explained is if the source of the radiation was like a high ultraviolet um, uh, what's called a vacuum uh, ultraviolet radiation if that was the source uh, then uh, pretty much that would have required six to eight billion watts of light energy and you wouldn't have to worry about a carbon dating if that was the source. Mm -hmm. However, if the source of the radiation is particle radiation, in other words, a neutron flow, if that was the source because the entire body basically uh, you know, dis disintegrated in, in, in a nuclear, a low temperature nuclear disintegration. Hmm. It would have caused a flow of radiation. I mean, by the way, that, that's just as miraculous as six to eight billion watts hmm. of light energy. I mean, uh, you, you know, you got all these stable atomic nuclei suddenly disintegrating, you know, uh, you know, a, a, atomic disintegration. Uh, you know, that, that, that's really weird at a low temperature. Now, but if that were the case, then what would have happened in that neutron flow is that those um, um, that the the, uh, the neutrons that would have been embedded uh, into um, uh, the cloth uh, would have turned a series of the uh, of uh, you know some of the uh, uh, atoms in that cloth into carbon 14, unfortunately, and so. Um, uh, basically, um, you have a real problem of an abundance of carbon-14 produced by a neutron flow. If that's the case, then no carbon dating in the future will ever be valid. Uh, you'll have to validate mm -hmm. the, the shroud through maybe um, some form of spectroscopy, uh, you know, like um, uh, has been done. They, they, mm -hmm. they have a Fourier-transformed infrared spectroscopy result. Uh, that was done by Giulio Fonti and his team, they, uh, which comes pretty close to 50 AD, uh, uh, right in that neighborhood. Wow, okay. You also have uh, um, a Raman laser spectroscopy, a mechanical compressibility and tension test, a variety of other tests that really do come close to the first century as alternative dating methods. But the carbon dating method, basically, if, if you've got some nitrogen uh, isotopes being turned into carbon-14 isotopes, if that's what's uh, taking place through some form of particle radiation that's 
emanating from the body in a complete nuclear disintegration. You're just going to have an overabundance of carbon-14, which will throw all the carbon dating off in the future. So I think people are waiting. But okay. the main thing is, is there's several different isotopes we can test for in the shroud. So we need to have a preliminary test of the cloth to see if there's other kinds of isotopes there that would only occur in abundance hmm. through a nuclear disintegration that would produce particle radiation. And if that were the case, uh, then we wouldn't give another carbon-14 dating. However, if we did not find those isotopes, then a carbon-14 dating, another alternative one, with spots that were not contaminated by a fire, uh, the fire of Chambéry, et cetera, Excellent. that would be very appropriate okay. indeed. Okay, with that, we shall take a break. Thank you so much, <laughs> Father Spitzer, on, <laughs> on the Shroud of Turin. Much more ahead, more questions here on the program. Stay with us. And we are back for part two of Father Spitzer's Universe. Thanks for staying with us. Two common defenses against evil from Father's book, Christ versus Satan in our daily lives. Father was talking about the Shroud of Turin. We got some a couple other questions for him as well before we get to our topic. So we can get some uh, letters in that people sent us in. Dear Father Spitzer, given all that is happening to us and the whole world with the pandemic, the wars, is God mad at us? Eileen. Well, um, I don't think that God is mad at all of us. Um, I think that God is mad in a different way than we would get mad. Uh, you know, it doesn't have a, a huge temper tantrum. I think what God is, you know, he in his justice, um, you know, feels, um, you know, the sense of injustice that we might perpetrate and, and that you might call that a, a kind of a form of, of anger, but it's not like our, you know, ventilating out there uh, in the same way. But with that proviso there, um, would I say that God is, uh, you know, I think God is definitely disappointed with the culture. I think he feels not only disappointed, but he feels in many ways uh, that um, people have, uh, you know, chosen against a morality that is decent to one, one another and that corresponds with his will as the creator of us uh, that, that we ought to know about. So I do think in a sense that yes, God has that, that uh, real sense of, uh, of, um, you know, of, uh, of uh, disappointment mm -hmm. and uh, very much a sense too of, of uh, you know, uh, a justice that can be uh, mitigated by his mercy if we ask for his mercy and try to do better. So I think we, uh, I, I think that that's mm -hmm. there. Now, if you're asking me, do I think that, um, that God is being retributive mm -hmm. here? No, I don't think God is being purely retributive and I don't think God really is purely retributive. I, I, I don't, that is to say that he gets even with people. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that that's, that's really what's going on. I think though that God will use these crises in order to maybe kind of put it out there that, that there's a need for conversion. There's a need to turn back to justice to, to people. There's a need to turn back to the teachings of his son, that there's a need to turn uh, back to the will of the creator manifest in our conscience, et cetera. We need mm -hmm. to sort of uh, go, you know, we need to metanoia, as Jesus would say, to turn around, to turn back, to convert, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, in our hearts. Now, he'll use it. Now, do I think that, for example, COVID, do I think that was God sort of getting even? No, I, I don't. I think that somebody in China basically allowed 
a terrible experimental virus to escape. And I do think even though it's covered over by people, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there is definitely a point, uh, what we call a center of transmission, uh, you know, that's, that's obviously a source point, like mm -hmm. the source point of a fire, we can identify. Mm -hmm. So I do think that there's a natural cause of this. And in God's permissive will, he allows it to happen. But I do think it is remarkable mm -hmm. that the... Um, the staying power of, of this particular virus is not like that of the Spanish flu. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't, th I, I think it's also quite remarkable uh, that it has not created like a, a well, um, the killing of a third of the population, like the bubonic plague, right. something of that nature. So it is a much more mild kind of virus. It has created many deaths. There's no doubt about that but nowhere near the levels of the Spanish flu or the bubonic plague or some of the other terrible pandemics uh, that we have uh, seen in the past. Uh, and so I do think, you know, God's permissive will is allowing some of this to happen, but mm -hmm. also I think he is mitigating these things, even with the various variants. Notice that the variants that come about, right. they're mutating downwards. That is to say, they're becoming less and less uh, you know, killer uh, right. viruses, even though they may be more infectious. Right, they're more very contagious. Are, more people get them, but yeah. less people have problems yeah. with it. Right. Well, that's right, but mm -hmm. less people have problems. And the problems are not nearly as bad right. as they were. Mm -hmm. So something going on there. I think the same thing with the Ukraine war. Do I think that this is, you know, God being retributive? I don't. I think it's basically you've got, you know, a, a, a Russian... Uh, uh, premier who's kind of going crazy mm -hmm. uh, right now with um, a lot of agendas, uh, but none of them completely explicable of the kind of war mm -hmm. that he's waging. I, I, I can't, I'm still perplexed, utterly perplexed by what he is up to uh, in this. I, I, I think he's, it's a matter of pride for him. I think there's also, uh, he's got some interests, you know, maybe vis-a-vis -vis NATO, but, you know, trying to take over the country right. surrounding the capital because you got a problem with uh, Ukraine being in NATO, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Some people have said, well, there were biological, uh, you know, testing stations that were there in the Ukraine. Maybe there were. Uh, why not just knock those out? Uh, which you could do in one simple airstrike. You don't have to take over the whole country right. uh, to do that. So, I mean, this this is there's something uh, that I do not get, but it's definitely not God. Mm. It's definitely Absolutely. of the making of human beings. And so, again, d God's permitting this. But, you know, God brings good things out of all of these right. kinds of crises. And a part of them is the good thing of conversion. You know, out of, you know, terrible things that have happened in the church are the best church reforms ever. Out of terrible things that happened in the war, you know, economic rights and, so, uh, you know, and the pursuit of international, uh, you know, courts have happened. You know, all kinds of good things have happened uh, out of the ashes of terrible, terrible things that have taken place in the world. So, yeah, I think God does allow uh, these things to happen. I think in our faith, uh, we, we have seen in the past that we've been able to not only overcome them, but somehow some good has come out of terrible travesties uh, that have taken place. And um, uh, we have made mm -hmm. some progress in, in uh, these things, but also, again, we seem to go right back to the trough of mm -hmm. abandoning our morality and values. And so when that happens, we find ourselves uh, back into some destitute moments where we need right. to make some real critical decisions. Mm -hmm. So it's God's permissive will. Well, what do they say in World War II? There's no atheists in a foxhole, you know? Yeah. So, uh, you uh, know, when you're under uh, fire, it's true. amazing how you turn to the Lord, but when things, oh, yeah. are, things are okay, it's easy to kind of drift away. Uh, yep, so that's very true. Let's talk very about uh, two common defenses against evil um, from page uh, mm -hmm. 195. You talk about that the Holy Spirit actively resists the suggestions of evil spirits proposing counter suggestions to those proposed by them. Have you ever experienced that? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, this is typical Ignatian discernment. 
uh, where Ignatius says, you know, you've got two spirits uh, that are working, you know, the evil spirit. Uh, well, he, uh, first of all, he divides people into two groups, people of the first week, people of the second week. People of the first week are people who are not on the road to conversion, mm -hmm. as Ignatius describes them, kind of basically moving from mortal sin to mortal sin, the entertainment of mortal sin to the entertainment of mortal sin, and they're just kind of moving out there. They don't really have a sense of God or a desire uh, for God or even maybe rejecting God. Whatever the case is, uh, the evil spirit's got a clean path to encourage them toward every imaginable temptation. So uh, essentially, he says Ignatius, in that way, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the first week, um, the devil is very encouraging. And he's very, you know, positive and up, you know, lifting. He's trying to get you to but think about, if you thought that was great, think about this. I got the new uh, iteration on that sin that you're really going to love. Mm -hmm. And so he's the encouraging spirit. Whereas, of course, the Holy Spirit, says Ignatius, mm -hmm. is the discouraging spirit. Spirit. Mm -hmm. And how does the Holy Spirit work? Through, he, he says Ignatius, stinging the conscience with emptiness and alienation and loneliness and guilt and dread. So in other words, there. even though you say, well, I couldn't be happier. I've got more wealth that I've stolen from people, and I really like it. Mm -hmm. And there's more, you know, um, you know I, I'm looking at more and more pornography, and I really like it. Mm -hmm. And I've just been as vain as I could possibly be, and everybody admires me, and I really like it. At the same time, says Ignatius, you will still feel an increase of emptiness and alienation mm. and loneliness and dread and guilt, uh, which is bordering on despair. And this uh, explains this series of correlations I've been talking about, you know, in various past programs. Mm. So, you know, for example, there is a strong correlation between religious disaffiliation, so not having any religion, being a nun, N-O-N-E in the um, Pew Survey words, mm. between, um, you know, religious disaffiliation and increase, significantly doubling, tripling increases in uh, uh, depression, anxiety, substance abuse, familial tensions, suicidality, actual suicides, antisocial aggressivity, etc. So that, that's a, a strong correlation. Uh, those people are not happy people. Mm. So the Holy Spirit is not necessarily sending those negative things into the person. When a person literally divorces themselves from God, when using their freedom, they say, I don't want to have anything to do with you. I want to live my sinful life and I'm happy. Mm -hmm. But when the Holy Spirit withdraws from those people, they sink. They do not have a bully inside of themselves to hold themselves hmm. up. They sink in meaning. They sink in substance. And, and when you start sinking in meaning and substance and dignity and hope and, and, and in your real eternal destiny, when you start sinking in all of that, you're increasing in depression and anxiety and malaise and emptiness and alienation, loneliness, dread and guilt, etc. So you're, you're moving yourself toward the course of despair. The Holy Spirit is just, you know, when he's withdrawing, oh, it's killing us. It's absolutely killing us. And so uh, basically mm -hmm. what Ignatius is saying is, look, see, it's the opposite mm -hmm. of the evil spirit. The evil spirit saying, hey, there's going to be higher and higher highs. You're going to be so happy if you follow me. And the Holy Spirit says, well, you're pushing me off. Mm -hmm. And when you push me off, you're going to see you're not going to like it very much because you need me for meaning. You need me for balance. You need me for a sense of fullness and, and fulfillment. You need me for a sense of meaning and dignity. You need me for a sense of hope because I'm your creator. And I'm telling you now, you divorce yourself from me and you go into a kind of an emptiness. Mm -hmm. All the things that matter go away and you're going to feel it. Now, says Ignatius, there's a second group of people. And the second group is called the people of the second week, obviously. And what he means the second week of the exercises. Mm -hmm. And those people are just the opposite. Now they're not moving 
from mortal sin to mortal sin. They're not moving from, uh, you know, uh, entertaining mortals into entertaining mortals. They're actually trying to stay on the road to conversion. They've, they're going to church. They're trying to get to the sacraments. They're trying to basically l learn the, the moral teaching of Jesus and trying to follow the moral teaching of Jesus. They're trying to deepen their lives of prayer, their relationship with the Lord. So they're trying, they're on the road to converge. Doesn't mean at all that they're perfect. Could fall back into a lot of things. But nevertheless, basically, as St. Teresa of Avila would say, they went into the first mansion. And maybe they're even going into the second mansion. The, the main thing, though, is what the rules change mm -hmm. because now which spirit is encouraged the holy spirit's coming on with greater peace with a greater sense of holiness with sometimes you say well i don't feel anything you don't have to feel anything mm -hmm. you'll notice that you have a greater sense of security you may not feel it but when you're acting that security is moving through you'll have a greater sense of being anchored in God. You'll have a greater sense of being in an eternity, eternal destiny. You'll have a greater sense of being anchored to something of real substance, something of eternal substance, something that's going to last. And you might not feel anything, but when you're acting, oh, you're a completely different person. And by the way, there's something that's not affecting you. You've drawn closer to the Holy Spirit, and therefore the emptiness begins to subside, and therefore the, um, the, the, the dread subsides, and the loneliness subsides, and the guilt subsides, because you're with the Lord. You're not close to that darkness and that void. And of course, the whole, oh, what's the evil spirit doing? While the Holy Spirit is protecting you and giving you that non-emptiness, alienation, loneliness, the, oh, the evil spirit is going, oh, Spitzer's going forward. <laughs> uh, I've got to do something about this. So what is he going to do? He's going to say, aha, I'm going to give him some nightmares. That, you know, I'll throw him off balance. And he'll wonder why this is happening to him. Or I'm going to really make life tough. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start really pouring on the temptation, drawing him back. And then if he can't do that, then he's going to try and get you uh, by what's called, you know, uh, appearing as an angel of light. So he's going to come and say, oh, you're making so much progress. You should be proud of yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're making so much progress. You can defeat all eight deadly sins. You can do it tomorrow. Oh. Oh, you're making right. so much progress. More penance is what you need in your life. The best kind is to put rocks in your shoes and wear a hair shirt to the point, of course, where you're completely discombobulated with the pain and agony and so forth and so on. So he's always going to come with what looks to be a good suggestion, but it's going to be a mm -hmm. very bad outcome. So, but he's powerless. You're rendering him powerless. Just don't pay attention to his little tricks. Don't pay attention to the nightmares. Mm -hmm. Don't pay attention to his little, you know, low lows where he's trying, or don't pay attention to the fact that he sends a little person out there to really kick you a good one or mm -hmm. try and bust your chops in some mm -hmm. kind of a public setting. Don't worry about it. Put, yourselves in, put yourself in God's hands, answer the best way you can, but trust in God. If you keep on that path to conversion, you're going to foil him. And that's the main thing is he, he will reinforce you. It'll be, it won't, first, of course, you get first fervor, which is really pretty good. Mm -hmm. That you do feel uh, when you're in first fervor. But then as you kind of move along, the Holy Spirit, you know, gives you less and less of that mm -hmm. felt support. Mm -hmm. But don't worry, you're getting all the other supports at the same time. Decreased emptiness, alienation, loneliness, increased substance and meaning in life right. and hope and the sense of eternity and anchoring in a real solid, uh, solid dignity. Now you're talking here, you say, about the idea that evidently evil spirits prefer to work with people who have no knowledge of either Christian or any religious or moral teachings, thus their ideal subjects are those who have no involvement in any church community, because one of your defenses is mm -hmm. being involved in the church, right? Absolutely. And so, of course, if you don't have a church, you're in trouble, mm -hmm. uh, because, of course, you're on your own. And, and, you know, the, the evil spirit is really pretty sophisticated. And, you know, if, you, if you're just basically on your own trying to keep your head above water, 
I'm telling you, he's, the temptations are going to be irresistible. And then he's going to present the rationalizations to you. This is always his trick. So he's going to tell you that all these sins are really good. Or he's going to tell you, you just can't help it. You have to do these things. You know, you're blameless for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. He's going to keep providing the rationalization. He's going to keep intensifying the temptations. And eventually, what he's going to do is try and drag you into his darkness. He's going to want you to kind of, you know, uh, you know, to ask him for some favors, as it mm -hmm. were. You know, to try and, you know, uh, uh, present some things to you that will invite him ever more deeply uh, in, into your life. So beware, you know, as, as Jesus tells us, the road to perdition is pretty wide and it's easy to get onto. The thing is, is if you let your, if you keep going down the road, it gets harder and harder to turn your back on that stuff. Not just because you're getting addicted to it and so forth, but you're buying into the rationalizations that he's providing you with. You're buying into his, all of his stuff about God that he's telling you. He's propagandizing you on the road into to perdition. He propagandizes you about God, propagandizes you about what morality really is. He propagand he's trying to convince you that the culture is really right. You know, why don't you join this group? Why don't you join that group? Hey, why don't you just join this group that, hey, they just do a little uh, devil worshiping over the weekend. Uh, don't worry about that. It's kind of fun. You know, I mean, everybody's doing it, you know. And so, I mean, the, the next thing you know is uh, you're in real deep darkness and trouble. And you got to stop right. w when you can stop. And the church, why? That's the sacrament of reconciliation, the Holy Eucharist, the teaching of Jesus as interpreted by that same church. That's the church community. That's all those people rolled up into one big, huge defense. I mean, it's huge. And to not have it, mm -hmm. I mean, can you imagine? I, I, I couldn't imagine. Without the church, I would be in deep trouble right now. Every bit of my talent would probably be poured into something mm. horrible. Mm. But with the church, I have been rescued. Starting with the day of my baptism, my parental training that was so wonderful, the Holy right. Eucharist, and, and of course the reconciliations that I've received throughout the year. Oh, I mean, and the te teaching of the church. You know, where would I be? I, 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 I know I where you'd such be. such a good rationalizer. You, you'd, yeah. be out there, you'd be out there creating spitzo currency. That's what you'd be doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> probably. Yeah, probably so. I, I did have a love for money at one time, <laughs> there I you must go. admit. And there you it was go. pretty pronounced. <laughs> <laughs> What's well, yeah. also interesting here, just in the closing two minutes, uh, talk about the evil spirit and the idea of a double benefit because not only it turns that person and then that forces them into power and domination, but then not only do they hurt themselves, but they get the benefit from the from the evil one of hurting other people. Oh, yeah. And so that's the whole idea is that, you know, the evil spirit's not just looking to bring you into his domain of dark, eternal darkness. He, he wants you to help him. And that's what the, you know, eventually you get into that lifestyle. Uh, how, how, what's the only way you can assuage your guilt and to maintain those rationalizations that you've put your quote unquote faith mm -hmm. in? Well, you've got to get other people to agree with you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you try to start winning people over to the dark logic. You start trying to win people over uh, to, to the darkness of that lifestyle to become, you know, uh, you know, a, a real narcissist and to become a real uh, absolute freedom advocate, to become, a, a, you know, a, a person who's just a sensualist. And, you know, sensualism plus narcissism, you're well on the road already uh, to really getting uh, smashed in, in, in the long result. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have a church to defend you. You don't have anything uh, you know, like a sacrament of reconciliation to rescue you uh, at, at that point, I mean, you're, you've only got one course left. Bring a lot of people along with you. That'll help you justify your actions. That'll help you justify the rationalizations that you've put your faith in. So you bring those people along and you become a great disciple and a great advocate of the evil spirit, bringing in more and more disciples mm -hmm. for him until you wake up one day and you find that he has so much power over you that you can't break out of it. You have just become so much of his advocate, you just can't break out of it. 
And so, of course, uh, at that point, you are in trouble unless you go running back to Jesus Christ. Go running back to the church. Do not pass go. Just keep going right back to that church. Get to that sacrament of reconciliation. Start receiving Holy Communion again. And if need be, you just may have to get exercised. I, I have to tell you, if you get down far enough, you, you, you have no idea who you're playing with. And he Absolutely. does. He grips you. And those talon, talons are sunk deeply into the shoulder. Okay, well, we are taking a break here. We've got to wrap the show up. Uh, and if you mm -hmm. can give us your blessing on the way out there, Absolutely. Lord Father, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. And bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And in this Easter season, may the Lord grant you through his Holy Spirit that hope in Easter, that hope in the resurrection, that hope in the life of eternal love, that hope that comes through following the teaching of Jesus onto the path of that resurrection and that eternal life, that you might be the true disciple of Jesus Christ, the resurrection and his love, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen, thank you so much, Father Spitzer. Be well and uh, enjoy uh, this Easter week. And I'm Doug Keck. Reminding you to join us again next week. Our topic will continue with two common defenses against evil. Father has much more to say about that. Don't forget, EWTN bookmark. There's none on Sunday because of all of our wonderful uh, events coming up from Divine Mercy. But we've got a wonderful program, Understanding Divine Mercy. It's a book interview I did with Father Chris Alar, a uh, popular host here on EWTN from uh, our shrine up in Stockbridge. Of course, our great friends of Divine Mercy. In addition to that, we also have, I think, the most events from Divine Mercy Sunday ever. Events from Krakow, Poland, Vilnius, Lithuania, Stockbridge, Massachusetts, the Shrine, of course, of the Most Blessed Sacrament in Hansville with the Sisters featured. Check out EWTN.com for times and events in your area. It's all here. Divine Mercy, swim in it. It's important. We'll see you next time right here on Father Spitzer's Universe.